39. 39, possibly 41. For me, the Arizona holds a special place in my heart. I've had the privilege of being on it once for a defining moment in my life. I've had the privilege of touching it once underwater, and I've had the privilege of touching a piece of it once above water. The first time I went to the Arizona, I was a young Marine, and I was in Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. I just had arrived in Hawaii, and our company commander, Captain Goldner, decided to have a, for lack of a better way of describing it, a field trip, like we were back in grade school. So we put on our little Charlie uniforms, and we got on buses, literally school buses, and we were off across the island, and we arrived at the museum, and eventually the little boats took us across Fort Island to um, the actual Arizona, and now I understand there's a bridge there, so there's no little boat ride off to the Arizona. Bummer. And we got on the Arizona, you, you, you enter on one side, and you go through the memorial, and it goes down, it comes up, and in the far end, you have all the names of all the sailors who are interned still to this day aboard the this, this ship. It is a sealed tomb. And off to the one side are all the Marines, all my fellow Marines that unfortunately went into service and did not make it home. About half an hour of us being there, all of a sudden a whole bunch of local Japanese tourists arrived. And they were laughing, and they were smoking and joking. They were having a good old time. And we were about to give them free swimming lessons before they got us off the boat. Our officers, our senior staff and CEOs, got us back on the boats and got us out of there before we caused potentially a small international incident, because we were not having a part of it. And I remember something that the tourist guy that rides the boats, that works for the, the Department of Interior, said. So you have to understand, from their perspective, we started the war and we attacked them in 1936. Now, you're, all of you are probably thinking, 1936? And it stuck with me. And I went to Okinawa and I found a history book in Japanese. The pictures are pictures, and I could tell it was about the Pearl Harbor because the burning picture of the Arizona. I brought it back to Hawaii, and I found someone to read it for me. And I understood from, from that that history isn't black and white. History is about perspectives. And unfortunately, history is gray. And to acquire a statement from a really good novel, it's darker shades of gray. I went on, finished my, um, my time in Hawaii, and before I left, I had the opportunity, I was a military diver, I learned how to dive on Fort Island, and we would overlook the Arizona. And the, the salvage divers periodically would go dive the hall, and they would do work on it to, to patch up holes, to make sure as much of the oil is in the ship, will stay in the ship, and eventually if it depletes, it'll deplete and drips instead of flushing goals that would do you know, a lot of um, traumatic damage to the environment. And so I got the privilege to dive to Arizona. It sits in 40 feet of water. It's, it's almost all under silt. You know, and periodically, they, the one thing they hate when people do is they throw coins. It's not a wishing well, but they throw coins. And they don't understand that the, the metal of the coins in salt water causes a lot of harm to the the degrading of the ship. So they got to collect all this change. And then they basically donate it to charities, other things. But in the process, I, that's where we had to get the like out of the, the gun wells and stuff um, to try to keep it as solvent as possible. So that's my, my second time is I actually got to touch the Arizona underwater. And it's just kind of creepy to know that on the other side of that hall, there are still a lot of remains of a lot of sailors and Marines that will be there forever. So I get out, and I, I just thought I'd become a police officer. That's what my family wanted. They're all Chicago cops. And I had the opportunity to go into the, the Army Reserves. They had this awesome recruiting poster. It said, sometimes Marines make better soldiers. I'm thinking, what the hell? They only run two miles. How hard can it be? <laughs> and I didn't realize, you know, everyone says the defining moment of your life would probably be boot camp or something. For me, it was in the Army Reserves. I was an instructor, and I had the opportunity to go to West Point and teach. So tactics, troop leading procedures, map reading, 1997. I came home, and I told my dad, I had the wrong degree. I didn't want to be a police officer. That's what they wanted me to be, and I was going to go get a degree in history. And I told them what I planned to do with my life. And no, there's some children in the room, so Elijah, 
close your ears, right? So close your ears. My dad said, are you so effing stupid you think you could play show and tell and make an effing career out of it? Obviously his words were a little bit more colorful. And um, I laid out my business, historic military impressions, the exhibits we do. It's to honor the past by educating the future. And I, I take that mission very seriously. My son Elijah helps me. My daughter Rachel is about to start helping me. We have met seven Medal of Honor recipients. We have met Tuskegee Airmen. We have met some of the most uncommon people you could ever imagine. We met gentlemen who they gave the 203 the gentleman in Vietnam who was the boot three days in country. There was some movement on the other side of a bush. He shot the 203 through the bush and stuck a guy right in the gut and hit him right. And he had a live grenade in his hip. And I remember he's telling me this story and he's talking about how he, I don't understand why they were so paranoid, why they had a helicopter come in separate and later on and all the concerns. And I said, and should be thankful that he didn't roll around. And I explained him what that meant. And, that, and at this point, like 20, 30, 40 years later, he's like, good God, I could have died. He, that, he didn't realize it at that moment. So I like to be the, the keeper of stories. Ultimately, that's what it means to be a historian. We keep other people's stories for the next generation. So when we came up with this contest, um, I think the essay question idea Desmond brought it up, and I thought it was an awesome idea, and I pushed the essay question. Why is it important for America to remember events like Pearl Harbor and the sacrifice of citizens like Paul Herrick? It's a loaded question. Because I'll tell you as a historian, history is the most important subject that is taught in school. That is not a core subject. You have reading, writing, and math, and after that, history is the most critical subject that is absolutely dismissed. And it's critically important. We have social studies, and social studies is not history. Today, we live in an environment where we're repackaging extremely bad ideas and giving them new names. And we think we'll get a different result. We forget that when the Dred Scott decision was passed, freed slaves thought it was a great idea to be separate but equal. And they have heralded as, we'll go off and make our own little communities. And because we don't want to deal with the people who once called us property, and we want to be by ourselves. And we saw where it went. And we had a, a young radical lawyer went and met another young radical preacher while he was in jail in Memphis and said, you know, Martin, the way you're doing it is all wrong. You use the law to defeat the law. That lawyer was Thurgood Thomas. He became the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court. And he successfully used <coughs> Roe, or excuse me, the Dred Scott decision to defeat the Dred Scott decision. And he argued that we cannot be separate and equal, that we are united in the common purpose. In the words of um, Frederick Douglass, the young Frederick Douglass once said, the Constitution was the most racist document ever created, and it was about keeping slaves. A wiser, more knowledgeable Frederick Douglass at the dedication of the Emancipation Monument in Washington, D.C. said the Constitution of the United States was the most brilliant form of government ever created by man. The problem with the Constitution is that we lack citizens that are capable of living up to its expectations. Yeah. So we need to remind ourselves that sacrifice of people like Paul Herrick or some of the Tuskegee Airmen that I met that had to like at night go to other units and steal parts off of other airplanes to keep those birds flying are examples of men and women who were courageous enough to live up to the expectations of the Constitution. Because ultimately at the end of it, if we forget where our past is, if we forget to honor the past, we give up power over our future. And today we have young Americans talking about wanting separate dorms and wanting separate this and somehow thinking they'll get a different result. Well, we've tried this experiment and it has failed more than one time in human history. So for me and for my family, the exhibits that we do are try to remind people to ultimately we have power over the future only if we have a good understanding of our past. Yeah. Yeah, I can, 10 whole minutes, right on time. Thank you. 
If you have any questions on my exhibit, please uh, ask. If you have any questions on me, now is the time. If not, 1936. 1936. You don't know what happened in 1936? 1936, the Japanese government invaded China. China was called the, in the incident. The, the Japanese medal is called the incident medal. It was an incident. But we put a tariff on, on Japan. We cut off their oil. We cut off other trade with them because China was an ally of the United States. And they took that as an act of aggression. From their perspective, we attacked them in 1936. What about what about the riverboat that they sunk first? We don't know. <laughs> you know, so again, it goes into this thing about revisionist history. How many people like when history is revised? You know what I'm saying? Yes. History should be revised. Everyone heard of the diary of Anne Frank? It's really the diaries of Anne Frank. We know there's probably two diaries missing that are right in the middle that if they turned up and someone discovered them and they realized that they were really Anne Frank's diaries, would her story be revised? Absolutely. The question isn't whether history is revised. The question is why is it being revised? Today we have a lot of revision for political purposes. And, and sometimes they use partial truths to justify that. I'm going to step on the topic of statues. <laughs> yes, most Civil War statues were put up in the 50s for racist reasons. Segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, as uh, a certain governor once spouted. However, today segregation is over. The governor got thrown out of office, and the policies have been put to rest because we had Americans that chose to live to a higher standard. So those statues also remember, remind us that we have, a, as a people, have the ability to overcome the policies, the bad policies of government. And we're losing that too. We should remember we were a slave nation because the work isn't done yet. But that doesn't mean we bear the sins of ancestors we may not have known. I mean, I. I came to the United States because my ancestors wanted to avoid Nazism and persecution from that. So to tell me that somehow I'm responsible for something people did before any of my ancestors got here is kind of ludicrous. But that's the threat that we face today. Anything else? Carl, yes. Yeah, I have one complaint. Uh, not a complaint, but I'm wondering where you come up with the social studies not being taught with history in mind. Because it is. I taught social studies. And to me, you always fall back. If you teach social studies the right way, yes. it's always about history and timelines. And But is social studies the way you taught it when you taught yes. the same as social studies today? Well, I don't know. I thought I, I've been retired for 25 years or 21 years. So I, <laughs> I am actually a social studies teacher. Sixth mm -hmm. grade. Okay. And, stuff. and basically, uh, when it comes to history, um, it is something that is taught uh, a couple of years during uh, elementary school, where you mm -hmm. get the uh, where you get from the uh, Native Americans to the Civil War, and then from Reconstruction to the present, mm -hmm. and then you will get that again between eighth and ninth grade, and then you have your advanced classes um, on that and stuff. Now, other than that, I'm talking American history, but you'll also get into medieval times and so on. Um, in sixth grade, I teach geography, so where things are and why we why we do things there. But I agree with what you're saying is, is that there's nothing that's dedicated purely to history, mm -hmm. um, to where social studies is something much more broad yes. and stuff. And uh, uh, what what many what many schools what my school is I actually teach at Lincoln, where we will take uh, we will take history lessons and stuff, and they and they and they make great cause and effect and. Uh, and uh, persuasive essays based off of history, and we'll use it in an English class or or uh, or something like that to be able to go what they call across the curriculum and mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, um, yeah, um, it, it is something that is uh, social studies is so broad. There isn't anything that's like like you would uh, like like it was just hey I, I'm taking history and stuff. There's there's many other things and kind of like of science where there's life science earth science and so on. I taught the sixth grade for 28 years and then I went to fifth grade. And I know the sixth grade, they, they only handled the Civil War part for a brief amount of time. Was that the end? It all depends on the individual. 
if there's a lot of, you know, I'm not trying to take anything against no. teacher, but no. there are good teachers or bad teachers. It all depends on the criteria, but we, we are losing, over time, things are changing. I, I once met a gentleman, he was a, a medic in Patton's Third Army, and they came across the first concentration camps, or, and um, he, he had to stop American soldiers from feeding the inmates, for lack of a better way of putting it. And they were told to go get cameras, go into town, find cameras, steal film, don't care. And they brought it back, and he's like, start taking pictures. And he had seven rolls of film. And at the end, he's like, he took the film, he walked up to his captain, he set them on a table. And the captain took four, and he gave him back three. He said, we'll tell you what to do with those later. He said, later, all the medics were brought together. It was the first time he saw Patton and Eisenhower in the same spot. And he said that Eisenhower told him that he was going to go home and he was going to develop that film after he got back, the war ended, and that he would be a testimony to what he saw there. Because, and as Eisenhower said, I will be damned if the day comes that someone tries to say that this did not happen. And today there are people in the world who try to say the Holocaust did not happen. So over time, it, it, it's incrementalism over time that ends up potentially in a bad place. And we have to then ask ourselves, why are they changing it? What's the intent? Is it to try to get us back to a pure truth, a better understanding, a better foundation that we could build off? Or are they trying to torque things because they don't like what it means? Anything else? Well, thank you for your time.